Cynthia, hey, thanks so much for joining us on WTOP. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we're here talking the brand new Amazon Prime series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. And we wanted to chat with you because it's sort of like a hometown hero uh, so, sort of a story. Uh, before we get into Lord of the Rings itself, remind, remind us, you know, your local roots. I know you were you were born in London, but you moved to this area, uh, Silver Springish, right? When you were when you were pre pretty young, right? Yes, correct. So, yes, I am London born, but Silver Spring raised and, and proudly so. So. Yeah, I was about four years old when uh, my mother and I moved to Silver Spring, Maryland, and uh, very much spent my formative years there. And, and it's something that, uh, you know, when you're sort of on press tours, uh, you have a lot of time to be very reflective and you think a lot about how sort of, you know, what sort of shaped and influenced you when you were younger. And, and I sort of really have a lot of appreciation for for growing up and going to school in, in Silver Spring and just sort of how it has informed my worldview in a really positive way, especially, you know, now that I'm getting to work on, on something like this, which, you know, we're taking a, we're definitely taking a, a very new um, and multicultural approach, I think, to this material, which is, is really exciting. Oh, I want to go into exactly what you said about the new multicultural approach um, in one second. But one final follow up about the, the local angle here. So I know you went to Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring. Uh, any memories of like, did you do school productions? Like, I want to know, did you what plays or musicals or anything that you started? Very much so. I, I so, yes, I went to Montgomery Blair High School um, and I was in the magnet program there. And so what's so funny about that is that, you know, when I was in high school, you know, I was very much on this track that was dedicated to math and science and computer science. And then I took this very sort of sharp left turn into the performing arts, but I did, you know, the school plays and productions. I was Annie and Blair's production of Annie back in the day. I was in Fiddler on the Roof. I was in Anything Goes. Um, and what was so great was, you know, at that time, you know, there's obviously a lot of conversation around, you know, diversity and inclusion in casting. But what was so lovely was that back then that just sort of organically happened in a way that, you know, never made me feel like there were limitations for, you know, the type of role I was allowed to portray. So that's something that, like I said, in thinking back on it, it really informed my ability to, in, in sort of the current day, feel like, yeah, I, I can play a variety of things. I don't want to feel a sense of limitation based on how I look or where I'm from or how I sound. Um, so I, I appreciate my time doing my sort of high school productions. I have very fond memories of, of those times. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I know that um, I remember when they did sort of an update of Annie. And I remember thinking, you know, I was, I was a black Annie back in the day. Like I'm, I'm proud <laughs> to be able to say that. Right. So, yeah. We've definitely come, come a long way, um, you know, from my time then to sort of what the landscape looks like now in, in, uh, Hollywood and, and beyond. Yeah, you're like, I was playing Annie back when Jay-Z was doing Hard Knock Life, long before they revived it for the, the new Annie. But uh, awesome. All right, well, uh, let's get to Lord of the Rings. I'll fill in the gap for our listeners really fast. So the, obviously after Blair and Silver Spring, you went to NYU Tisch School of the Arts and studied theater. And then that sort of launched your career into a bunch of roles. People remember you in uh, Power on Stars. Um, you were in that Ben Affleck movie, uh, The Accountant, Spartacus. You, you, you've done it all. Um, but that brings us up to Lord of the Rings, the Rings of the Power. Now it's such a, um, you know, it's such a beloved uh, franchise, um, but I guess remind our listeners when it's set because, because the Hobbit was technically a prequel. It was set before the Lord of the Rings, you know, the movie trilogy. So the, the Hobbit was before that, but then this goes even way before, like, like hundreds of years before, right? Yeah, so most viewers, you know, people are familiar with, with the films. The films deal in the third age. And in terms of what Tolkien has laid out, there's a first age, second age, third age. And, and so our adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power is set in the second age. Of Middle Earth, the history of Middle Earth, right? Yeah, and what's really great about that is that, you know, there are going to be a lot of things that will feel familiar to audiences who are knowledgeable about the books, the, the films, other adaptations. Um, but you also get to see things that are, are new and different. And, you know, in my part of the world, I, I am part of um, 
uh, a part of Tolkien's world, uh, it's the island kingdom of Numenor. And so it's something that if you're familiar with the lore, you've read about it, this is the first time you're gonna actually get to see it on screen. So there are a lot of great things that we're getting to sort of put into this adaptation that people know about and maybe heard about and now we get to show it. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting thing to you know, get to be for some people their, their first um, sort of introduction to this world. Because I think for definitely younger viewers, you know, the films, uh, which a lot of people are familiar with, that was, believe it or not, you know, 20, 20 odd years ago. Hard to believe. For, it was 2001 to 2003, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's great that you're going to have younger viewers where this is their first time getting to see a story from Tolkien's imagination, you know, when you go all the way back to the source. And um, it's, it's a spectacular, amazing, epic, you know, version of this second age. And there's a lot of lore to mine. So, you know, I'm excited for people to, to see what we've created. Yeah, that's, it, that's really interesting because, yeah, I mean, I know there was, you know, like, for instance, like when they come up with like the Star Wars prequels, people are like, okay, now you got to watch, go watch them in order. You know, they sit their kids down, they got to watch them in order. And so, you know, in, it might be where they'll actually sit down and show their kids your, you know, your series first, and then they'll show them the Hobbit movies, and then they'll get to the Lord <laughs> of the Rings, you know, it'll probably be like a 30 hour experience their eyes will be <laughs> blood, bloodshot because those are long movies yeah, but um but no but it's kind of cool that that you get you're going to be on the front end of that now um well tell it to you you mentioned that it covers it shows a lot of a lot of the stuff that maybe we heard about or you know those maybe like opening graphic credits of the lord of the rings movies you know where we see middle or second age we see the forging of the rings do we see the forging of the rings do we see the rise of of dark lord sauron you know what what do we see um, you're going to see a lot of things, uh, some of some of which I can't divulge. Right. Um, and when we sort of start uh, with our our story, you know, we're really starting at a time of relative peace in Middle Earth. So it's you know part of it is you want to have somewhere to go because there are going to be a lot of things that we sort of fit into this first season. Um, but yeah, there are definitely notable sort of points along the way for pe for people again who are familiar with Tolkien's lore um and what i think is great in terms of what the showrunners and the writers have come up with is you might know the end point of some of these things but you don't know how we're going to get there and so there are a lot of really creative roots to some of these iconic moments like you said like the forging of the rings and you know so i, I think that that's what is going to be uh that's when what's going to have the ability to surprise people who might be really familiar with this material but it, what's also great is that if you've never read the books, if you've never seen the movies, you're going to be able to come to this and, and understand what's going on. So you don't need prior knowledge of the works to be able to, you know, go along this ride. And, and yeah, I think that I'm mostly excited for people who are new to this to really get swept away in this story because it's, you know, Tolkien's imagination is just sort of boundless. Right, exactly. It, it like you're saying, it'll it'll speak to, uh, it'll have all the com familiar comforts of for 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 longtime fans, but it's it's completely fresh and uh, sort of an origin for all new new viewers. So tell us about tell us about this particular character that you play, um, the the Queen of Numenor. You said, uh, you know what what's sort of her 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 arc uh, uh, here? What what does she have to go through here? So so I am playing the Queen Regent Midiel. Uh, and so the, there's a bit of a hint in, in the title. So queen regent, meaning that she's not fully a queen, but she is the current leader of the island kingdom of Numenor. And Numenor is essentially Tolkien's take on the legend of Atlantis. Mm. So, you know, people might be vaguely familiar with that legend. You know, there, there's definitely a tragic element to, to this story. But when we are introduced to queen regent Midiel, we are basically meeting someone who is, um, you know, in her leadership is sort of at a crossroads. And in terms of where Numenorean society is at, there is a, a faction of society that wants to sort of maintain, you know, uh, a sort of um, the traditional ways. They have elven roots. They don't want to lose a sense of their history. So they want to, you know, be able to sort of respect and maintain those traditions. 
And then there's a segment of society that wants to, you know, tear down the old to build the new. They want to sort of um, be a society that is, um, you know, pr progressing and is innovating. And, and this is a sort of society that's at the height of its wealth and power. So when you look at history, and if you know your history well, you know, there are a lot of ancient kingdoms that there's a rise and an inevitable downfall. And so, you know, we get to explore a lot of those interesting ideas around what happens to great societies and, and sort of the hubris of those societies that ultimately lead to, to their downfall. Uh, sounds great. So yeah, I mean, this, uh, thanks for, for te teeing up the, what do you say, the, the story <laughs> and the, the themes. Uh, but I want to talk a little visually because I know the, the first two episodes are directed by J.A. Bayona. I think that's how you say it. And I've been a fan for years. Um, you know, he did a Monster Calls. Uh, he did that tsunami movie, The Impossible. And then the one that's probably his masterpiece, which my wife actually showed me just a few years ago, was The Orphanage. That, that was an amazing horror movie with so much more going on. But uh, wh how, what was it like working with J.A. and, you know, just crafting this visual world? So we, you know, over the course of our eight episodes for this first season, we have uh, three directors that uh, directed all the episodes. So J.A. directed the first two. Um, we also had uh, Wayne Yip, who directed several episodes, and Charlotte uh, Brandstrom, who directed episodes. And I primarily actually worked with Wayne and Charlotte. So oh, just gotcha. in terms of the order of filming, um, I sadly did not get the opportunity to work with J.A., but you know, what J.A. did and what all of the directors really did was sort of establish the, the look and feel and tone of how we were gonna sort of set up all these different worlds, introduce these characters. And, you know, when you're starting on a project like this and when you're inhabiting a role and you have to literally sort of create this role in a, in a collaborative way, you, you, you have all of these incredible resources. You know, we have an amazing dialect coach, our dialect coach Leith, our costume designer, Kate Hawley. You have all of these external elements that help you really build a character from the ground up and very much our pool of directors also were there, you know, day in, day out to sort of help you get that performance because you're trying to figure out who this person is in real time. You, you know, you have the text, you have the script, you have in, information that you can intellectualize and then you've got to really sort of present this person and get to the core of you know, who they are emotionally, what they're navigating, how they're feeling. Um, and so, yeah, our stable of directors, it was really incredible in terms of working with them to really get at the heart of who these characters are and what it is that, you know, they're trying to figure out for themselves and, and their sort of journeys individually. Um, so yeah, I mean, all the directors are incredible and, and you're going to see in the first two episodes, certainly a, an incredibly cinematic um, uh, story because the, even though we're on streaming and we're a streaming series, this is a cinematic production. You know, some of the, the, the framing of some of the shots, just the, the scope and the scale of everything, this isn't like anything you know, I have ever seen. And I, I think the audience is definitely going to see that when they when they see the show. Definitely. And uh, I know we're up against the clock, so this probably have to be the last one. But um, you mentioned at the top so I, about it being multicultural. So I wanted to double back to that before we run. Um, so, yeah, like at this, the series, obviously, Peter Jackson, it was so beloved. Um, but and with iconic characters, Frodo, Gandalf, Legolas, uh, Aragorn, uh, Samwise, Pippin, all, all, all those characters, Gollum. Um, but when you like to your point, when you stop and think about it, that's a lot of a lot of white guys. So um, talk <laughs> about how the idea now um, is to make this more multicultural and maybe even have some more strong female characters, too. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's to me, it's the way forward. Right. I mean, like I know what I as a viewer am drawn toward. And I think in this adaptation, we are really wanting to say everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome to enjoy this story, relate to this story. And you know, when you go back to the literature, there are a lot of people the world over that are massive Lord of the Rings fans, and and this material really carries meaning for them. And you know, as we sort of have been on the road, sort of you know, 
talking about the series, it really strikes me that in other countries, people love this material and we're getting the opportunity to, to you know, make this accessible because at the end of the day, Tolkien really was interested in different, different races, different groups coming together for common cause to defeat the enemy, defeat evil. Right. And so I think, you know, taking the global view, you know, we have the opportunity to really expand to a global audience and be reflective of that global audience. So I just think for my personal taste, this is something that's really exciting to me and also necessary and just the natural order of things. Like, I, I just think when I turn on the TV now, like, you know, especially in genre, you want to see the world as you know it to be, the world right. as you aspire for it to be. And I think it would be a missed opportunity to not proceed in this manner. And, and to your point as well about female characters, you know, like I think in the past, you know, we've seen a lot of the sort of fellowship in a very male heavy way. Um, I think with our female characters and, and definitely the character that I'm playing, there's this opportunity again to, to be really three-dimensional and, and show more and do more and, and show complexity. Um, and how could you not be excited for that? So I think you're going to see all of those things. And um, it, I'm proud to be part of that. I'm proud to be part of, of something that feels like the way forward, especially if you're going to do this adaptation in 2022 and beyond. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. It, it's an exciting time for fans of, you know, Lord of the Rings or, you know, or Game of Thrones or, you know, we're fine. We're getting to go back and explore these origins in these new TV series, which is which is fantastic. And you add the hometown hero angle uh, for you here. It's perfect for for WTOP in D.C. So we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor. And hello to uh, all my peeps in Silver Spring, Maryland. All the peeps in Silver Spring. Tune in <laughs> and, and beyond. Tune in to Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. Um, it's going to hit Amazon Prime on September 2nd, so don't miss it. Hey, thanks. Thank you.